Good evening. Today is Tuesday, December 14th, 2021. Uh, we are convened as the Provo City School District Board of Education. It, we are meeting at 280 West, 940 North in Provo, Utah. The time is about 7.04 p.m. Uh, and we will begin with a roll call. We'll start with Nate. Nate Bryson, board member. Terry McCabe, board member. McKay Jensen, board member. Keith Rattel, superintendent. Melanie Hall, board president. Rebecca Nielsen, board vice president. Jennifer Partridge, board member. Gina Hells. Gina Hells is attending uh, remotely, and then Derek Anderson, business administrator. Okay, is there a motion to convene? I move we convene our business meeting. All right, we are now in our business meeting. Uh, we will now have opening remarks by member Nate Bryson. Uh, I thought for my opening remarks, I would just say an opening prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, thank thee for thy many blessings. Please bless and watch over the children of this district and help us as uh, educators to be able to uh, know what they need and to be able to reach out to them. We love thee, Father. We say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Next, we're going to have the Pledge of Allegiance by Sophia Teixeira. I hope I said that right. Uh, a Centennial Middle School, eighth grade student, and she's part of the Latinos in Action and Student Leadership Council member. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Sophia. Next, we're gonna have an employee recognition by Jason Cox. Hi, good evening. Thank you for the opportunity. We have so many people to recognize in this time of year. It's really fun to be out and saying thank you to those who do such a great job for us here. Uh, so tonight we're recognizing, and I'd ask if you don't mind standing when I call your name, uh, we're actually going to recognize uh, the entire Centennial Middle, Middle School nutrition team. So Leanne Newtig is here to represent that team, but her entire group was rewarded, uh, awarded the recognition to, for the Provo Way Award. We also have Laura Fryer from Wasatch and Jason Garrison from here in the school district and his work with the uh, COVID safety meetings. And so we have our video, we'll go ahead and watch the video. And then uh, we'd love for those of you who are here tonight to be able to come up and let the board get an opportunity to thank you personally for your work. Thanks for joining us. We are here with the celebrations committee from, uh, from the school district and we're here to celebrate the, uh, the child nutrition staff at Centennial Middle School. Uh, we're, we're grateful for all the great work they do and we're happy to celebrate them. So I want to just make sure that you, you hear today how thankful we are for the work that you're doing. Um, Laura is the person who actually nominated your group and she nominated in the nomination talked about how you've been short staffed worked so hard, there's been so many things that you've been doing to try to help the kids here feel like they're being served, they have a great meal, they see cheery, nice people when they come in to the restroom. So we want to say thank you to all of you uh, and present you with our Pro Way Awards. And We're the Celebrations Committee, and we're here today at Wasatch Elementary to recognize Laura Fryer, a sub extraordinaire. Um, Chris Furman, the principal here at Wasatch, is going to be filling in for our board member, and we'll go in there and let him present the award to her. We're and what are we celebrating? You. You. Why? We're here to give you the Provo Way Award. The Provo Way Award. We love Laura. <laughs> she brings so much joy and happiness to everyone around her. She is one of our interventionists, and by default, she has stepped in to be an on-call substitute teacher for us at the drop of a hat. She is loved by everyone here. You can see her out on the playground, pushing kids on the swing, playing games with them, 
or working in a small group helping our kiddos get caught up, or usually at 8 o'clock in the morning you'll hear Laura Fryer, please come to the <laughs> office. <laughs> and that's her signal to know she's going to be subbing, whether it's mm -hmm. PE, she did that for a week for us. Yeah. She is wonderful, and we feel so lucky to have you. Thank you for Thank all that you, you do. That's because I act like a child. <laughs> <laughs> Good afternoon. We are the Celebrations Committee, and we are here to honor one of our favorite individuals, Jason Garrison. Follow me. On behalf of the board, we want to say congratulations, and you is well deserved. This is for all of those safety committee meetings that you've been in. I don't even. What number are we on? 189. 189, and Suzanne is the one that nominated you, and especially for your work up at Edgemont. So we want to say congratulations. Yes. I uh, received recently in student services the opportunity to work with Jason. I don't know anyone who works harder or longer and with more intensity to do what's right for people. He is really wanting to make sure that people are served. I have not seen anyone that you know, selfless in a long time in my career. So when I've got him over health and safety, I sleep at night knowing that we're good in those two areas. So thanks so much, Jason, for all that you do Thank for you. our district. Appreciate Thank it. You. Appreciate it. Let's give them a round of applause. We'll have, coming up, we'll have you start right over here on this side. And we want to, again, allow our board members to thank you personally for the work that you do. Be very careful. There is a cord right here. We just don't want you to trip. So come on up and start right over here. Thank you. It's so fun to recognize all those great employees of our district. Next, we're going to have a uh, school report by Kyle Bates. Um, he's the principal of Centennial Middle School. I guess you know you're getting to that age when you have to ask somebody who's, you know, in their 30s or 40s how to operate technology. <laughs> um, first of all, I'd like to thank the Board of Education, Superintendent Rattel, and uh, the district office uh, staff and our community for those uh, who are here and not here for the opportunity to present tonight. Um, we'll give our presentation on Centennial Middle School. The first slide here is... Um, just kind of a, a demographic profile of the school. And just really quickly, you can see our enrollment, which is uh, down a little bit. The number in red is the decrease over the last two school years. So two years ago, when I gave this report, we had 106 more kids than we have now. Um, the decrease in enrollment was not unexpected, though, because um, we had a, a large bubble of students come through in what is now the ninth grade class at Timview High School. So this is. 1,130 kids is about where we traditionally have been for the last five or six years, absent those two years where we had that large uh, bubble come through our school. So enrollment is slightly down, but we're not, we're not terribly concerned about that. We anticipated that. The next line talks just about kind of the, the mobility aspect of Centennial Middle School. So two years ago, we had just over 100 kids that registered for school after School, the school year started and before I presented to the board in October. Um, this year we've had nearly 200 students, 181 that have registered for school after the first day of school, which is an increase of 72, and another 93 students that have transferred out of our school since the school year began. Um, and I guess 
my point in noting that is just to give kudos to our counseling center and our registrar because in addition to managing the day-to-day -day affairs of 1,132 students, they've also handled almost 300 transfers in and out of the school in the first semester of the school year. Um, a little more demographic information. We, I got the free and reduced price school lunch numbers from, our, uh, from Leanne and her staff today. The last accurate number we have kind of pre-pandemic was 36%, and our fee waivers typically mirror that pretty closely. We're somewhere in the upper 30% range on fee waivers. Um, our English language learning population is growing, which is a tremendous blessing for us at Centennial. Um, I think the students who speak English as a second language or speak a language other than English in their homes have been attending our school for many years, and we're now to the point where we're identifying I believe just about every single child who is in that circumstance so we can provide support services, not just academically, but also linguistically. And that percent is 19% of our student body speaks a language other than English in their home. And that's up 4% from two years ago. Special education is 11%, which, just, which is just about the typical prevalence rate. I think it's 11.8% that the, is the kind of the standard prevalence rate but that population is up slightly from two years ago. And then you'll notice there's been a slight shift in our Hispanic population, which is increasing, and a slight decrease among our Caucasian students, um, and the overall de decrease in enrollment down to 1,132. So that's kind of what the school looks like day to day, who comes to, to learn with us. Here's our mission statement. Um, it hasn't changed from two years ago when I presented, and you guys have had the slideshow for a few days, so I won't walk through every aspect of it. I will say this, though. I was really proud of the work my leadership team and, and faculty and staff did putting this mission statement together a couple years ago because my assistant principal, Brooke Ann Taylor, went to Principal's Academy at uh, with the, her cohort of Principal Academy um, attendees which is a collection of administrators from across the BYU Public School Partnership partnership districts. There are like five or six districts that participate. So there's you know 40 or 50 people in this cohort. And they were doing, a, I think, a school visit. And one of the leaders, BYU professors, asked the group who knew their school's mission statement. And I am proud to say that not only did Brooke remember ours and share it with the group, but she was the only person in that group of administrators who knew what their school's mission statement was. So. We try and keep it pithy um, so people can remember it, and this is what drives what we do. We want to empower learners for life. That means everyone who comes into our building gains a greater measure of control over their future based on the interactions they have while they're with us. Um, end of level test data from last spring. A couple things I'll note really quickly. Um, this, These are the 20 middle schools and high schools in the state of Utah who are most demographically similar to Centennial Middle School starting with Canyon View Junior High, which matches us like 96%, down to Central Davis Junior High, which is like an 85% match. The blue bar at the top is our proficiency scores in English, math, and science. The blue bar down the center of each column is that percent when compared to the other 20 schools most like us in the state of Utah. And so um, obviously there's some, some work to be done in mathematics. Um, we rank 12th of, the, of those 21 schools in, in mathematics. I, the one kind of context I'll give to that number is that our high school students who take, or our students who take high school math classes like SM1 and SM2, SM2 is not tested, so those kids are not part of that number. And historically, I don't know how they did it last spring, I haven't been able to figure that out yet, but last time I checked, the SM1 students were disaggregated and reported separately because it's a high school class and we're a middle school, junior high school. So um, I think that number would be slightly higher if those kids were all included, because we have about 200 students who take SM1 or SM2. But we're going to focus in our math PLCs on, on getting that number up. Science is ranked sixth, which I'm really proud of. Um, but the most impressive thing to me is our English department, which ranked first in the state in our demographic for proficiency, proficiency scores on end of level testing. And I did a little research on some of the other schools, and at least one of the schools on that list has a magnet program. And we even outperformed them. So our English department, which has a very high functioning um, PLC, is really doing a great job working with students. And again, 
recognizing that one out of every five students who come into our English classrooms speak a language other than English at home. So we're not just fighting the content, but linguistically there's a challenge there as well that our English department is handling quite well. A little bit about our English, our ESL program. Um, we have 223 students identified as English language learners. They're leveled from levels one through six, with one being a beginning or emergent English speaker and six being somebody who's transitioning out of the ESL program. Um, I won't go through all the, the details of this particular slide. I just want to show that, um, oops, let me go back one here. We have pretty solid growth scores on our WIDA access testing. So if you look at the bottom, in the last two years, uh, more than half of our ESL students have had significant growth. And when you see 0.73, that means they're going from like a level two almost to a level three, or a level three to a level four. Um, and that's pretty impressive when you consider that, first of all, there's we have 11 sections of English language development. So we can service students on levels one through six and group them by age and ability level. But again, we have dozens of students who are ones and twos, which means it's difficult for some of them even to carry on a, a conversation casual conversation in English, and certainly academics is much more difficult than that. But the uh, English language development program we have set up is really helping these kids move forward. And again, when I got to Centennial 10 years ago, we had identified and we were serving about 10 kids. Now we serve well over 200, which means I get content area instruction in gen ed classrooms and also have support classes, many of them. And in addition to that, an English language development class that focuses specifically on acquiring English, both uh, basic interpersonal communication and academic language. Um, this slide is just a rubric for how they score our DLI programs. And all I'll say about this is that in middle school, they want our DLI kids to perform in the low intermediate to mid intermediate range on the four tested areas, which are interpersonal listening and speaking, presentational writing, interpretive listening, and interpretive reading. And so the next three slides are how our kids tested most recently in dual language immersion. If you look up the left side, you'll see that we're hitting pretty, pretty consistently in all three DLI strands in all four tested areas, the state expectation for proficiency, which is that low to mid intermediate range, I1, I2, I3. The thing that I find most impressive though is our comparisons to the national average. That's that orange dot you see in the, in the center of each of those bars. So in all four tested areas, our Chinese kids and our French students and our Spanish students outperform the national average by considerable margins. And I'll just go back one slide really quickly and give again kudos to my French DLI students and their teacher Sarah Nelly Barrett who comes to us from Belgium and is a a passionate and really energetic and talented young teacher and has the highest scores of, of all of our DLI teachers, um, both in terms of proficiency and comparison to the national average. So the kids in the French program who come to us from Edgemont are doing phenomenally. Um, then quickly, points of pride. I want to just highlight quickly our Kindness Club and the Kindness Week that we've been celebrating at Centennial for several years now. and. I just heard, talked to my social worker today. The, the Kindness Club is taking a, a retreat or field trip to BYU here soon, so we're looking forward to that. Um, they met today with Ben Young during Plus Time. And we have a broad variety of programs that are all super exciting, robotics and STEM and AVID, and um, a lot of other things. Our performing arts and visual arts are, are I think, tremendous. But I'm really, I want to focus just for a second on the PTA, because they do so much for our school. Our PTA parents, that come and meet monthly and take on challenges like Red and White Ribbon Week and teacher appreciation are a huge source of strength to our school. And if you ask any teacher in our building, they'll tell you that our PTA is, is amazing. So I want to thank uh, previous PTA presidents like Marcy Lamonier and Brittany Wood, who heads the PTA this year, and all the parents who work with them and have worked with them because it's just a really it's awesome to watch them come in and do great things for kids and for teachers and support us in the work we do. Um, like any school, we have challenges. The one thing I'll highlight really quickly here, two things actually. Um, Brooke Taylor, my assistant principal, who is amazing, 
took it upon herself this summer um, to go out and she and my PBIS coordinator, Amy Brown, and the so social worker, I think Ben Young was involved as well, went out and conducted more than 100 home visits last summer just to meet the kids. And they, and they went out and specifically met kids for whom they thought the transition to middle school might be problematic for a number of reasons. And, and just going into their homes and meeting the students before the first day of school and meeting their families and their parents changed that whole dynamic. And so the kids that sometimes struggle, every one of those kids knows Brooke and she visited most of their homes this summer. So that was super, uh, I think super important to get the school year off on a, a good note. And then the counseling center has done an awesome job with the pandemic, mental health, social skills, uh, even managing technology, which kids use much more frequently now with the Chromebooks and um, the remote learning we've done over the last couple of years. All those challenges come into our school and come into our counseling center. And the counselors have done a phenomenal job supporting students as they wrestle with things that, that some of them have never had to deal with before. So. Um, strategies for increasing student achievement. The focus here is gonna be on our weekly PLCs. And I've challenged all of the PLCs this year to put their scope and sequence and their common formative assessments and all the documents they've created into a digital notebook so that we can comb through that and see the work they've been doing for the last six or seven years. Um, this, is, this is why the English scores, for example, were so high. The English PLC has mapped out the entire year and they teach in unison and I did observations the other day, it happened to be in uh, an art class, but I went into two art classes on the same day and the teachers were teaching the same learning target, the same essential standard. And they taught it differently and with a different group of kids, but, but the kids are getting that guaranteed viable curriculum that Superintendent Rattel challenged us to get to our kids several years ago. And I'm really proud of the work our teachers have done to create that, that scope and sequence to ensure that every kid has a common experience and gets the essential content, but it's done in, in a, a structured way so we don't leave kids behind. Um, these next two slides are just a list of about 80 things that I brainstormed one day when I look back on my decade at Centennial Middle School. And again, I won't go through this list. It's not exhaustive, I'll tell you that. There's much more, but these are some of the things that we've done in the decade I've been there. And, and if you, some of them are kind of self-explanatory and some of them seem pretty, you know, fairly insignificant, but, but they're all important because it's part of that dynamic culture of change and progress that we've been working to instill and to carry on day to day and year to year at Centennial. So we've, we've updated, revised, reviewed, replaced, or started almost every program, class, policy, procedure at that school in the last decade. We're, we're trying our very best to be dynamic, and but be thoughtful in that process where we don't just change for the sake of change, but we, we're very thoughtful when we do it. Um, and then the next slide again, just the AVID program has been a, a new kind of challenge in the last couple of years we've taken on, but we've done things like providing a student wellness room and then a wellness room for our teachers. We've translated all of our key documents into Spanish, including the entire course catalog, which has more than 150 classes. Um, signage in the school is all bilingual. We've expanded support staff positions as instructional aides and trackers, and expanded our PBIS program. Um, technology is ubiquitous. At interactive TVs in every classroom, Chromebook in every student's hands. Um, we just, we've tried again to be dynamic and not get stuck. The process of going from being a good school to being a great school is all about taking on challenges and not resting on your laurels. And we try to honor that uh, every day at Centennial. So that's what I have to offer by way of explanation and with what's going on at Centennial. What questions do you guys have? Good list. <laughs> Thank you for doing that. <laughs> Thanks. I've got a quick question. I'm curious about the numbers you gave us at the very beginning with it feels like there's quite a few students in, quite a few students out. Is that normal? Is that pretty average for any year? Yeah, the tip, we started tracking this about five years ago um, because my registrar, I think it was part of a conversation about her work hours. She was always getting overtime and people were wondering why she was working 50 hours a week. And she's like, you need to understand how many kids come and go. And every one of those transfers in and out is handled personally by Lisa Vizani, our registrar, who is again, amazing. 
So I asked her just to start tracking the number, and it's pretty consistently right around 100. This year it's almost doubled, and I'm, I'm guessing, I talked to, to Todd McKee earlier today, um, my best guess is just that, well, I think everyone's life is a little bit in flux right now with what's going on, and, and he said, you know, this could be also a bunch of students coming back to school now, the transfer's in, after they maybe spend a year or so at home with the pandemic. Um, but yes, yeah, typically about 100 this year, it's been closer to 200, and the transfer's out again, pretty standard. You know, I think the number this year was 93 kids that have transferred out already this year. But it really speaks to something that I, I'm not sure everyone in our community understands how how highly mobile the school is, how many kids come and go each year. Um, and, and the other challenges we deal with, whether it's socioeconomic status or, you know, cultural things or linguistic things or, um, again, the mobility. Uh, we are an extremely diverse school and, and becoming more diverse each and every day. So again, we have to be dynamic in response to that and, and thoughtful as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Um, so first of all, thank you for all the hard work that you're doing. Um, I've had a couple of kids come through Centennial and I've seen all the good things and the improvements that have happened over time and I think the PBIS and all those kinds of things are, are great. Um, I was going to ask my, so I have a daughter there now and she loves the um, incentives you give if no one in the class is tardy. And I'm wondering if you've seen improvements in the tardies and attendance and things with some of the, the things you're doing with that. Yeah, in, in fact, the, the, the one time we've done kind of a systematic study, what we found is that if you, if you make tardies a point of emphasis, however you track it and however you reward on-time attendance, the, the first time we did this a couple of years ago, we cut tardiness in half in, in one term, one nine-week period, 50% reduction. And actually, Chris Furman was my assistant principal at that time. But yeah, when you reward kids, and this is what we try to do with PBIS is stop focusing on what kids are struggling with and start focusing on what they're getting right and incentivizing the behaviors you desire so you see more of that and and then maybe focusing a little less on what they're doing wrong and and focusing more on what you want them to do right so yeah when we go out and, and incentivize on-time attendance um, on-time attendance in, increases always and we just need to do more of it it's it's easy to give a little tardy push and then maybe let it slide to the back burner when something else blows up. But yeah, we, we've, we've focused on that. And when we do, we see attendance improve. So, okay. So one of the most dramatic changes is that five by five schedule, mm -hmm. which lets you do lots of different things there. I mean, you can personalize a kid's schedule, but you've added a lot of, of, uh, electives. Um, I'm, I'm curious if, you know, I, I don't know if you have any data or anything or just your eyes and what you're feeling. Do you, what impact do you think that's had on kids just liking school, that there are more places for them to grab hold of? Has that had an impact at all in that regard? Yeah, because, um, you know, we often talk about how students who may not enjoy school or be as good at the academic side of school will hook into other things. And the, and the classic anecdote is the football player whose coach gets him to come to school and stay eligible so he can play football. Um, and it's true. I mean, n not every kid gets up in the morning, especially in middle school, just craving to go to school to learn English, math, and science. But we have so many other things they can do. And the beautiful thing about the five by five is you don't have to give up the, the things you enjoy to get additional help in core academic subjects so that you can succeed there as well. So with 10 periods, a kid can be double blocked in math and English and science, and some of our ELD kids are even triple blocked in English and still have four or five periods left over for elective classes, um, which allows them to participate in the band or be in the dance program. I was talking to Derek before we started here. We had our first dance concert post-pandemic. Um, so the first one we've had in a couple of years where we had everyone in the auditorium and we have a new dance teacher and we've changed the program to make it more inclusive. It used to be very strictly ballroom. Um, and now we do all sorts of genres of dance. And when I went to the concert last Thursday night to supervise, there were more than 150 kids who danced in that dance concert. Um, and all types of students, you could tell some had never danced before. And we had 
boys up there doing contemporary stuff, which I've never seen in my 10 years at Centennial. And we had, again, people that you knew had never danced before they joined the dance class here at, at, at Centennial. Um, and to see 150 kids dancing together, all varieties, all shapes, all sizes, all ability levels, um, and having fun. And they came out on stage at the end, and there they sat, 150 strong. And we've never had that. So it's things like that that the 5x5 five five allows us to do and know that those kids that are on stage are also getting the help they need in English, math, and science so they can be successful there too. Our band program is basically doubled in size, orchestra as well. Keith, you're a musician, you'll appreciate this. We now have pretty consistently two, our top two bands and orchestras go to the state festival every year now and get superior ratings, which again, we, we could not do without that 5x5 five five schedule. So. Anything else? We're glad you're there. Okay. Thanks for your for all the time spent there and the investment you made because it's continues on a on an upward trans, uh, trajectory and that has still a lot to do with leadership. So thank you. I appreciate it, uh, McKay. Um, and I just I'll just say in closing, I love what I do. I love where I do it. We have the and, and to a place now where if anything goes wrong at Centennial, it's absolutely my fault because not only am I the principal but I've had a hand in hiring almost every teacher and staff member in the entire building. There's only five teachers left who were there when I got there 10 years ago. It really is a school that my faculty staff and I have co-created over the last decade, and I love it. So it's an honor and a privilege. I'm blessed to be there. Thank you for the opportunity to present and also for the opportunity to be the principal at Centennial Middle School. Thank you, Mr. Bates. We've now come to the portion of our meeting where we have public input. If you haven't already and would like to address the board, on my right, your left, is a form that needs to be filled out and then handed to Bonnie, our secretary up here, um, if you would like to address the board and then I will call you up one by one. You'll have three minutes and if you address the board, we would also like to have you state your name and which area or school you belong to. So um, the first person, is Daniel Caldwell. Good evening, school board members. I am, my name is Daniel Caldwell. Uh, my children attend Sunset View Elementary. Um, as I said, my name is Daniel Caldwell. I'm here tonight with my partner, Tyler Bryan. Um, we're parents of three elementary school children here in the district, and we want our children to have the best educational experience possible, as I'm sure you all do for your children. As such, we feel it's important for our children to feel accepted and part of their school community. Part of that acceptance is feeling that their family and their life experience is represented and seen as valuable. It's often argued that representation of LGBTQ plus people is not necessary in the elementary school setting, as it's not an issue within this age group. The problem with this type of thinking is that it's labeling the existence of LGBTQ plus people as an issue, and it is making it seem as if the existence of LGBTQ people is purely a sexual thing that does not emerge until adolescence. This type of thinking is harmful and is not backed by research. Some children are very aware of their sexuality at a younger age, and even if they're not, all children need to be taught from an age, a young age that whoever they become as an adolescent or as an adult is valuable and worthy. In addition, if we're talking about the, um, the transgender part of the LGBTQ plus community, many of these individuals become very aware of their gender and who they are at the age of two or three, at the same time the rest of us become aware of our gender. Um, lastly, even if, children who, even if children were not aware of their own sexuality, there are many children like my own who come from families where their parents are part of the LGBTQ plus community. These children deserve to know that their families are valued just like the other children. This is not a hypothetical situation. These children are currently in all of our Provo Elementary, Middle School, and High Schools. We would like to encourage the school board to consider taking a small step to help, take these, to help these children um, who are connected to the LGBTQ plus community to feel welcome, included, and safe in their schools through more representation of LGBTQ plus, um, I'm sorry, 
um, materials in the libraries. Um, through literature and portrayal of LGBTQ plus people and families in a positive light. In addition to these efforts, we are currently working with Doug Finch and Student Services uh, to make intake paperwork more inclusive for individuals and unique family, individuals from unique family situations. Hopefully together, uh, we can make Provo School District more inclusive and welcoming for all of our students and their families. Thank you for your consideration and for providing me with this time. Thank you. Uh, Emmy and Dory Kim. Hi, my name is Emmy Kim. I go to I go to Westridge Elementary in Provo School District. Why I'm here to talk is because I am talking about how inclusive books will make libraries more diverse. Why I think this is important is because one, kids will be able to see characters that look like them and that they can relate to with experiences and culture. Two, because we can learn about different people with different cultures and races. And three, because, because, because we can notice that people are different and different is okay. I'd like to give a thanks to the Provo School District for supporting me in my uh, books I'm doing, and I, and I hope I can keep doing this. I hope that, um, I hope that um, these books are doing good in libraries. Thank you. Um, I'll just add to that a little bit. There's not much to add, but. Um, I was recently reading a, a blog from Scholastic about why diverse books are so important. And as the speaker in front of, um, before us mentioned as well, it's so important for kids to see themselves and it's important for them to learn about other experiences. And um, she shared an experience about her son in kindergarten who had diabetes and he was being made fun of because the kids didn't know what that was. So the next day she sent her son to school with a book, a Mickey Mouse book about a friend named Coco who had diabetes. And the teacher was able to read that story to the class. And they were so much more open and understanding. They didn't make fun of her child anymore. And some of them even protected him from bullying. And she wrote something that I thought was so profound. And she said that that book changed the world for her son and it changed 100 plus hearts of children in helping them to be more empathetic. And so um, we hope that we can continue to do this for our school district and thank you for your support. Thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to address the board? So I just wanna let you know that we're thankful that you guys came here and the things that I heard were that we are looking for more representation in our elementary and other libraries. So thank you for coming. So we're gonna close the public input part um, and go on to our business items. Sorry, I gotta open my computer. All right. All right, our first motion, our First item on the agenda is to approve the 2023-2024 calendar. Um, Jason Cox, will you speak a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. We have a process that we uh, involve the community each year, and, and by community we allow our students, our faculty, our parents, um, all community members to participate in helping us uh, develop the calendar for the coming years. So we send out our primary, our first um, survey, which asks parents to kind of help us de determine what they feel is most important as far as starting the calendar, when in the year, the lengths of our holidays, those kinds of things. After we get that feedback from them in that uh, survey, then we create two calendars, two options, based on what they've given us as feedback, and we send it back out to the community for a vote. Um, we received feedback on the two calendars that we had presented, and calendar A received about 65% of the support for being this new calendar for the 23-24 school year, which, um, 
The difference between the two is this one started, I believe, a day earlier and added an extra day to the Christmas uh, winter holiday break. So, Jason, how long did that calendar survey reside out in the public to get feedback? Over three weeks. Uh, the the second portion, the first portion, was also a little over two weeks. So that we had it open both times for. Uh, we wanted to make sure that it was at least open for two weeks, but we went a little longer with both. Thank you. All right, is there a motion on this? I move that we approve the 2023-2024 calendar A as discussed in study session. Um, a motion made by board member Nielsen. Is there a second? I second it. Second by board member Bryson. Is there any further discussion on this motion? I, I move to amend the motion to wait if, until a future date so to approve the schedule to accommodate a possible March day off. Uh, there was a motion made by board member uh, McCabe. Is there a second? Okay, so that that amendment fails. So we'll go back to the original motion. Is there any further discussion on that? I would, yeah. my discussion would just be that we can continue talking as a board about things like possibly adding in days off, or I should say adjusting the calendar. Um, and then we can amend the calendar at a future date if we do decide to do something like that. Okay. Any other further comments or discussion? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor indicate with aye. 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 Gina got an eye, so. All right, next up is to approve the 2022 Board of Education meeting schedule. Um, I need to talk to you about this one. Every year we uh, put out a, the tentative dates. Most of them are solid, just so that the public understands when we will be meeting, so that they're aware of those dates of a year in advance. Um, is there a motion for the uh, meeting schedule? I move we approve the 2022 Board of Education meeting schedule. Okay, motion made by Board Member Jensen. Is there a second? I'll second that. I admit a second made by Board Member Partridge. Is there any further discussion on the that motion? All right, seeing none, all those in favor indicate with aye. 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 Uh, motion passes unanimously. All right, next is to approve out-of-state travel. Uh, Superintendent, will you discuss that? Yes, we discussed this particular trip. The, this trip is the uh, ballroom program from Timview High School, uh, but for whatever reason, it got dropped off of the approval agenda for the last meeting. So um, my uh, intrepid secretary was able to find that and uh, make it right and put it on the agenda and ask for your approval tonight. There were no objections or concerns at the time. It's just, we need to go through the formality we even tried to find out if they'd done this trip before so I could approve it, but indeed they have not. So this one needs to come before the board for approval. Okay, is there a motion on this? I move that we approve the out-of-state student travel as discussed in the November 9th, 2021 study session. Motion made by board member Pry Bryson. Is there a second? Second. Second by board member Nielsen. Is there any further discussion on this motion? All right, seeing none, all those in favor indicate with aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes unanimously. Next is to approve a real estate transaction. Uh, Superintendent, would you discuss that one? Thank you. Um, for the last several years, uh, we have been talking off and on with BYU about the possibility of exploring a real estate transaction over off of 900 East. Um, in the last year or so, that has come back to the surface and, um, and it, it has come together in a way that we were unable to make it happen before. So this is essentially a land swap. Um, 
there is some cash involved and the city is also potentially involved in this because there's a retention basin which is on our current property, would be on BYU's future property, but the retention basin serves the city. So uh, there will be a press release tomorrow morning that goes out about nine o'clock, but for the purposes of this discussion, the board has seen the purchase and sale agreement. Um, and essentially what we're doing is we're saying that uh, uh, we as a school district will acquire a property uh, located on Locust Lane of approximately 12 acres. And uh, we will build a new Wasatch Elementary School on that site. And we hope to be able to break ground on that sometime this summer. Uh, and then BYU in exchange, once the, once the new school has been built, BYU will uh, assume uh, possession of the current Wasatch Elementary School property on 900 East and uh, we're not sure what their plans are for that um, but uh, there's a lot of speculation that that will be in support of the new concert hall that's being built right across the street so um, that's what we know and uh, this has come together I appreciate uh, board members McKay, Jensen, um, Nate Bryson and Melanie Hall who have been part of discussions and negotiations also the team from BYU who is very cordial and and willing to work with us and uh, we met halfway on a number of items so um, this is now before the board to approve conditionally the condition is that we want to get um, an MOU a memorandum of understanding um, sorted out with the city to clarify their enroll their, their involvement in this process as well we have a verbal understanding of what that will look like, but we want to have a formal MR MOU so as to avoid any kinds of um, misunderstandings or disagreements in the future. So that's still under construction, but uh, so what's, what will be approved tonight is the purchase and sale agreement conditional on an MOU being formed with the city. All right, is there a motion on that? I could keep talking, but that's probably enough. I move that we approve uh, the uh, purchase and sale agreement for the Wasatch property with Brigham Young University as discussed and conditional on the MOU being established with the city. Motion made, made by board member uh, Jensen. Is there a second? I second that. Second by board member Partridge. Is there any further discussion on this motion? I move that we amend the contract to eliminate section 6.7 titled Foxfield property, which starts on page seven and section 6.8 titled option to purchase, which is on page eight and exhibit F, which is on page 29. Motion for amendment by board member uh, McCabe. Is there a second? All right, seeing none, we will go back to the original motion. Is there any further discussion on the motion? All right, seeing none, all those in favor indicate with aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes unanimously. Okay, next, uh, we need to approve the c consent calendar. Is there a motion? I move that we approve the consent calendar. Motion made by board member Partridge. Is there a second? I'll second. Second by board member Jensen. Is there any further discussion on the consent calendar? All right, seeing none, all those in favor indicate with aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes unanimously. Next, we will have a board member report by member Jennifer Partridge. Thank you. Um, a few things. I'm never sure if these board reports are me reporting to, or us reporting to the public or more to one another on the things we're working on. So I've kind of got a mix of both. But first, I just want to let the public know that as board members, we are always trying to um, learn and grow. And um, for example, we've had some constituents lately bring concern, or over the last few months bring concerns to us. And um, I, I've seen a lot of people on this board go out and really study the questions that people have brought to us and to see, um, 
you know, what their understanding is and see um, what we should do about that. And I really appreciate people engaging on that. Um, all of us are attending a um, Utah School Board Association um, training that's coming up in January um, so that we can keep learning and growing and doing our best to serve um, you guys and our students and our teachers. Um, and then for everybody, one of the um, committees that I serve on is our district kindness committee. And I just wanted to report, here's a picture here. We had our elementary school um, kindness retreat the beginning of October. We had approximately 260 students from all of our elementary schools come. Um, you can go ahead and go to the next picture, thanks. Um, and we uh, trained them on and gave them ideas on things they can do to work on kindness and um, reaching out to individuals and helping people feel welcome in their schools. Um, you can see some of the posters that they made. You can go to the last picture, thanks. Um, they did different team building activities and went back to their schools with ideas on how that they can um, make a difference in their school, both as individuals and as in involving the whole school in kindness. And that's something we've had in our district now for, I think we're on our seventh year of kindness clubs. And um, it's been great to see students take ownership of creating that culture in their schools. Um, as a committee, um, a few months ago, well, over the summer, we realized we could do better um, at supporting our secondary schools with kindness efforts because they um, are structured a little differently and the way we were addressing it um, served the elementary schools really well, but we needed to change some things to help our secondary schools. So we've been working on that and we, as uh, Kyle mentioned earlier, we are now planning a retreat for our secondary students um, coming up at the end of January. So any board members who would like to come, it will be January 26th and we will be holding it at the Harmon Building at BYU. Um, and we will be having representation from the kindness clubs at all of our secondary schools, um, which will be fantastic. I also wanted to report, um, I serve on the foundation board and they've been working really hard over the last months to um, increase uh, the ability to reach out to community uh, groups and businesses and things to raise awareness of what we do and what our needs are as a district and to uh, work on getting donations. And they are planning our um, annual Easter basket auction. We haven't actually done it for two years because of COVID. Um, so we're hoping this will be a really uh, big one. And it is planned right now for April 14th, which is the Thursday before Easter. Um, so we'd love to see both board members and the public come and support that. And then my last item is I want to wish Keith a happy birthday this last weekend. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Jennifer. Great report. Uh, superintendent's report. Well, on the matter of birthdays, we have several uh, members of council who have birthdays in, in December. Um, we have one member of council who's off tonight. Her husband recently had surgery, so she is not here tonight, but she would stand as well. But um, members of council, if you have a birthday in December, would you please stand? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Way too many Sagittarians here. Thank you. Um, so really what I wanted to say tonight was um, I, I have seen no travel requests other than the one that you just approved board. So um, I, I don't have any of those to report to you. I will tell you and the community tonight, um, I've been spending a lot of time looking at my phone tonight. You can check it, it's the weather app because uh, it, it, starting around midnight, the snow is supposed to begin. The weather.com app does show an hourly forecast and uh, it looks like by morning we could have a couple of inches depending on where the snow does in fact fall and stick in the city. So tomorrow morning could be an interesting call. Uh, for those of you who are unaware or didn't read some of the information that I sent, that uh, I, Will Caleb, sent out last week. Um, for tomorrow morning, for example, we will have a handful of drivers 
who get up and get hit the road about 4 a.m. and they will be uh, driving around to, to assess the conditions of the roads. At that point, they will report back to one person who will then call Derek. Derek, wave at everybody, our business administrator. And Derek will then assess that and he'll call me. So we will make a decision sometime by 515 as to what, if any, changes will need to occur. And, and a lot of people tend to ask, well, it's not that bad here or it's really bad here where I am. The fact is different snow conditions can exist all over town. And so uh, we just go on the recommendations of our driving group. And um, for the most part, they should have hit most of the hot spots, the higher elevations, as well as some of the busier streets. And those are our biggest concerns. Um, in the event that we have to make some type of decision, Kayla will be on social media and getting items out to the media to ensure that people know what, what those potential changes are. Uh, the options this year, we're trying not to cancel school, but we're trying to, in the event that we need to do something like that, we're trying to call it an at-home learning day or an online learning day. We send our, we're sending home our Chromebooks with uh, the elementary students uh, on a daily basis. Alex gets the word out to um, principals that there could be a storm on the way, and so the students take that home and the teachers are aware that they would be running at home um, learning day and they would be at home doing at home prep. This is a hedge against having to make up that day uh, later on in the year. We are allowed to run at home learning days on occasion when there's a need. So that's what we will do if, if needed. But we'll make that determination tomorrow. Personally, I'm hoping for a tropical wind to blow in. So um, that's my report for tonight and thank you everyone and I wish everyone a very happy holiday season. Well that comes to the end of our agenda. We'd like to thank you for attending and coming and again we wish everyone a very happy holidays and we'll see you in the new year. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Motion. I move that we adjourn this. <laughs> she got it. So moved. <laughs> I almost was going to spit it out in the mic too, thinking I'll just say it.